Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is True Spirituality and is part of the The Human Soul series. It was presented in Sydney, New South Wales, Australia on the 10th of June 2012. This is part two. Okay. Um, we decided that, uh, or we're, we're, we're thinking of deciding. Putting the point With your in. input. Yep. Um, we feel that the rest of the discussion, we've actually noted down the points of the rest of the discussion, which we will upload onto our website, and you can download it as a PDF document. And we felt that uh, because we only have about a half an hour left now of our time with you, that uh, that time would be uh, better spent perhaps getting to know you a little better um, and uh, answering some more individual questions that some of you may have here in Sydney that you would like to have answered. And if we can focus on the people who are in Sydney, uh, who live in Sydney, in terms of the answering of those questions, um, if you would like to engage that. If you would not like to engage that, then we're perfectly happy to continue with our discussion. What would you prefer? You'd like some your personal questions? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Good day. Well, well, let's uh, let's say then that the true spirituality discussion. If we can just summarise it, there are very easy and simple characteristics that we can measure with true spirituality, and there are characteristics characteristics we can measure with pseudo spirituality. And if you, in your investigation in your day to day life, just engage looking at everything that's spiritual, so-called spiritual in the world that we have around us, and try to compare with the characteristics of either, whether, whether they compare with the characteristics of pseudo-spirituality or true spirituality, you will be left with the ability to decide what forms of investigation are the best forms of investigation to take for yourself. And you won't need anybody else <laughs> saying to you, do this or do that or do this or do that, because you'll, f you'll find that your own heart will be able to decide, using those particular guidelines, you'll be able to decide for yourself <coughs> what, are, what is the most loving way to proceed with your own spiritual development. And that's what we would love to encourage you to do, to proceed with your own spiritual development, getting closer to God and, and looking at the different types of spirituality that you see around you and just asking yourself the question, does this sort of fit into the line of what we know pseudo-spirituality to be or does this fit into what we can see true, real spirituality to be? And we'd like to just encourage you to do that in your day-to-day -day lives as a form of personal investigation. So that being said, um, let's, uh, let's uh, finish that topic and proceed with answering anything you would like to ask for the next how, half an hour or so that we've got <laughs> to uh, answer the, the questions you have. Hands already. There's so we start at the back there. Thank you. Um, I've got a question about sexuality. Yes. Um, in particular, yesterday you mentioned several times um, that men have a penis and um, women have a vagina, and God would want us to use those organs sexually. Yeah. And when I was reflecting on that on that discussion afterwards, um, it, it felt as if the implication was that homosexuality is not in line with spirituality or God's wishes. So I guess my first question is, is it? And then the second question that follows that is, um, you've mentioned the word flaws several times. In God's eyes, is homosexuality a flaw in some people? Okay. Um, firstly, if we, to answer the question, we must understand the soul. And if we understand the soul, we will see that actually all souls that God has created all separate into the two halves when they incarnate. Right? Now... Each soul, before separation, has a percentage of masculinity and a percentage of femininity that is unique to itself. So if we drew one type of soul like that, we could say some souls have more an even split of masculinity versus femininity. And other souls have a much stronger split of masculinity and femininity. And other souls have a much stronger femininity than masculinity. So that's inherent in their personality. Inherent you're in their about. collective in the collective soul condition as a part of the personality of the soul itself. 
Now, these souls split in half when they incarnate. So you imagine a soul that has more masculinity in it in terms of percentage. When, it's, when it incarnates, it splits in half. So can you see it's going to have a little bit of femininity in each half and dominantly masculinity in, bo in both halves. Does that make sense? In this case here, this soul will have, if it, when it splits in half, it will have dominant femininity in both halves and a little bit of masculinity in each half. This soul, when it splits in half, one half is going to be dominantly feminine and the other half will be dominantly masculine. Now, it's the dominant sexual characteristic of the half of the soul that attracts the body that it enters. So in other words, when this soul splits, it will attract a male body on one half and a female body on the other. When this part of the soul splits, it will attract a male body on one half and a male body on the other. When this part of the soul splits, it will attract a female body on one half and a female on the other because of that being the dominant of each half of the soul. That being the case, homosexuality, sexuality, as we call it, we really need to rename it in a way to be called what is the, because this is the real point, what is the soul sexuality? The sexuality of each individual half of the soul. And in this case, you could say that it's heterosexual, where one half is female, the other half is male. In this case, you could say it's homosexual. One half is male and the other half is male. And in this case, one half is female and the other half female, so therefore homosexual in nature. So you could say it's not necessarily... I wouldn't call sexuality like, uh, is a person homosexual, bisexual or heterosexual? I'm only interested in one thing and that is what is the other half of the soul's attraction and what is the dominant uh, characteristic in terms of... Uh, in terms of um, uh, masculinity and gender. femininity yeah. inside of each part of the soul because that's what determines the gender of the body. Yes, That being the case, you could say God has created homosexuality. That being the case, it can't be a flaw. And therefore, it's a, I feel that any religion that portrays homosexuality as a flaw does not understand the creation of the soul. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah, is it also, isn't it also true, though, when we have a pure state, a, a uninjured sexuality within us, the only sexual attraction we have is for our soulmate. Exactly. So it won't be for many men. For me, it would be just for this one man. And if I was uh, homosexual, it wouldn't be for many women. It would just be for the woman who is my soulmate. So you understand what Mary's saying there? Sort of like when my soul splits, so here's my soul before it split, when it incarnates, it splits. So when my soul splits, if I am in a pure state, the only person that I'll be attracted to from a sexual perspective anywhere in the universe is the other half of my soul. That's the only person I'll be attracted to. So if I find myself attracted to many people, so if, so if Mary found herself attracted to many men, or I found myself attracted to many women sexually, then I'm yet to purify my connection with my own soul. Because once I purify my connection with my own soul, <coughs> I will actually find only one person turns me on and it will be the other half of my soul. That would be the only person that would turn me on. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. Uh, just on that point, I wasn't here yesterday, so I'm sorry if you covered it yesterday. That's okay. But you mentioned um, the splitting and... You mentioned the splitting in the incarnation of of incarnation. Sorry, of yes. of the soul. Yep. Um, can you explain that? I'm sorry. I'm sure. It's a, it's a part of this discussion, really. So there's three types of souls that I've drawn there, which are who's got the dominant characteristics. So it doesn't matter as to which type. So let's say I draw a soul in this case where it's it's got a dominant masculine trait and a smaller feminine. And when it splits, it splits in such a way that the masculine part is more dominant in both part sides. What will happen when I say it splits, when, when, when a, uh, a couple get together, have sex, and they produce a body for the soul to incarnate into, what happens is the soul itself splits in the two halves 
And each half attracts the body. Two bodies, actually. And there are two bodies created at the moment of conception. And in the case of this one that I'm drawing now, both of these halves will be male bodies. Uh -huh. Because ma masculinity is, the ma is, the, is more dominant in the entire soul before it's split. Now, in this state, it doesn't know itself. It doesn't know anything about its life. It doesn't know who it is. It doesn't, it's just incarnates. And as soon as it incarnates, it starts experiencing. And as soon as it starts experiencing, it starts discovering itself. And that's part of the process that God created to, for us to come to discover ourselves completely. And ourselves is not just our half. We also need to come to discover the other half of ourselves. And that's the process, that process where the soul now envelops the two bodies that the parents have created for it. That process is the process I call incarnation. Just what are the two bodies, babe? The two bodies being a physical body and the spirit body. Does that make sense? So you have two bodies. You've got a physical body and a spirit body and your half of the soul is connected to both of those bodies. Your soulmate, what, what is your dominant sexual attraction? Um, male or female? Male. Male. So your soulmate is male, right? And he will have two bodies. He's got a spirit body and a physical body and his half of the soul is, has, <coughs> is connected to those two bodies. And eventually, once you work through the different emotional injuries that cause you to be separate, you will eventually draw each other into each other's lives and you will eventually connect. And then as you grow, you will eventually become completely connected for the rest of your existence. And you will not be involved sexually with any other person because no other sexual relationship will satisfy you, in fact. Yep. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Very, very clear... Uh, I think understanding of how incarnation occurs as well. Um, mine's a personal question. Yep. Have you read the book Jesus Lived in India? And if so, do you find any truth in it at all? Or is it all a whole lot of hocus pocus? Yeah, no, no truth in it at all. Sorry. Right. Thank yeah. you. Um, the, the, there is a, a, long, a large school of thought that I lived in India because some of my teachings from the first century seem to have Indian philosophies involved in them. The reality is I learnt all of the teachings that I gave in the first century from God, from my relationship with God, and I actually didn't live anywhere other than Egypt or in Israel um, when I, in the first century. However, in my sleep state, as can you, uh, we can visit any place on earth. And obviously in my sleep state, I certainly have visited all places on earth, even in my first incarnation in the first century, I visited other locations. And sometimes that's what they're referring to. But I did not learn from any of those experiences um, the things that I learnt from, from my relationship with God. Yeah. yeah, I just found it interesting that there is such um, a lot of um, similarities between Christianity and Buddhism, like the Ten Commandments and the precepts for Buddhism. And, the, you know, uh, maybe, you know, you could have learnt those from the Buddha. Who knows? Yeah, the reality is that I also didn't learn from Judaism either. I, I felt, felt quite differently in my connection with God uh, than the, Juda the, the, the laws of Judaism taught, uh, just as I feel quite differently from what I learnt from God as to what I see in Buddhism and other relig religious formats. Um, I feel the connection with God is where you learn everything. And, and that's the primary thing that I'm trying to teach, how to have a connection with God so that you can learn. Does that make sense? So, so what became Christianity was really a bit of a distortion of what I was trying to do because what I was trying to do is show people how to have a personal connection with God so that God could teach them individually, not make a whole set of another set of rules that everyone had to follow um, and then cause it to become a religion as a result. That was not the underlying intention. Unfortunately, the way mankind is, they always want to make rules because rules simplify things to a degree because that means that we don't have to make decisions. Because do, do you see that? Like if, if, somebody, if society makes a rule for you, then your freedom of choice is taken away from you. And for many of us, we think that's a good thing because that means we're not having to make another choice. You know? And um, 
And so what we often do is we feel very attracted to religious formats that make rules so that we can avoid making our own choices and decisions and having to pay for them or enjoy them, one of the two. And my feelings are quite strong about that matter. I feel we all need to take personal responsibility for the lack of love in our life or the amount of love in our life, for the lack of truth in our life or the amount of truth in our life. And we need to engage this in a personal way with God. And once we do that, we will learn very rapidly from God. And because God has all truth, you and I will eventually know the same thing. Because if, as, as we, so like it drew before, if, if this is God and you and I are working towards God, it makes sense that sooner or later we're going to have the same opinion on certain subjects. Yes? Because we'll have God's opinion, not our own, on all subjects. And, and that's how I've always taught people to approach their life. Um, and I certainly never taught anybody to approach their life as treating me as their mediator or, or some kind of intermediary. Um, because I feel all we need to do is know how to have a relationship with God, then we can engage that relationship. Once we can engage that relationship... God can teach us all things that we want to learn. And it will depend totally on our desire as to how rapidly we learn that. Yep. Yep. Pleasure. How, how do we know um, if our connection with God is uh, spirit-influenced or if it's real, if it's with God? Good question. Um, I've answered those questions quite a number of times, particularly in these previous discussions that I've referred to. But if I can give a brief summary, perhaps, um, it, it will help. I imagine for a moment this is you. So this is not the real you, by the way. That's just your body, right? So here's your body, your physical body. Here's your spirit body, which is c connected to your physical body through a cord. And your soul actually envelops both bodies. Your soul controls both bodies, it controls its development, the development of both bodies or the degradation of both bodies are controlled by the soul's condition. All of those things are controlled by the soul. Now, if that's, that's you, the individual. Now, here's God and I do believe God is an individual. Because I've tried to connect to God using other means, other than viewing God to be an individual and never main, been able to have a connection. And through my history, I've only had a connection with God by seeing God and feeling God as an individual. Once I've done that, I've received love from God and received divine love from God through that process. Now, unfortunately for many of us, um, spirits who are passed over people, people who have passed... In, um, sometimes get involved with our relationship. And the reason why they do is because you, the individual, often has an immediate... We ha we're not patient, is probably the best way of putting it. We, we are, rather than patient, we are impatient. Right? In other words, we want immediate results. Yes? This is a, this is a factor of our day-to-day -day life generally. Now, because we are impatient, um, we are not prepared to go through a process many times that requires the refining of ourselves. Because this is what God is wanting us to do. He wants us to refine ourselves, to become more loving, right? And, and we're not willing to engage this process if it's a long-winded process. We want it to be over in a week. You know, or a day would even be better, or an hour or two, that would be really good. That's the way we see it many times, right? And so what happens is when, when we start beginning in this process of refinement, what we finish up doing is we finish up feeling impatient and we feel like we want immediate results. We want some kind of results. We want immediate results. And because of that emotion, this lack of, impatience, this lack of patience, we often start then wanting an addictive relationship with God. So we, we, we want God to respond to us when we want God. We don't want God when we don't want God. We, we don't want God to respond to us when we don't want him to respond. We don't want God to tell us things we don't want to hear. 
We don't want God to cause us to feel things that we don't want to feel. right? We only want God to cause us to feel things that we do want to feel. So we've become very selective. These are our addictions. Now, as soon as our addictions get projected towards God, God, of course, does not respond to addictions. Because God responds to the pure, sincere individual. right? But who will respond to addictions? Many spirits who are in the spirit world who are in an and addictive codependence, they will respond. So the only real way to work through our stuff, if you like, our collective emotional condition, is we need to firstly be focused on refining ourselves. But one of the first things we need to focus on refining is our addictions. Because it's our addictions that cause us to connect to spirits rather than God and then accept what they're saying to us as God telling us things. Yeah? Now, there are historically in history many, many people who have done this. In fact, almost every religion that's ever begun on this planet has begun through this process. In other words, the spirits who are in a certain place of addiction have told the person that they are God and then they start... This person then starts channeling all this information, religious information. And this happened to Moses. This happened to Muhammad. This happened to almost Buddha. It, this happened to almost the, begin the beginning of all religions have had this process where spirits in the spirit world have told the person a whole set of precepts or concepts or laws because the person doesn't want to deal with certain addictions they have. All right? And yes, Muhammad did have some addictions and so did Buddha and Right, so did these other people that you now know as major starts, starters of religion. And as a result of that, um, God, the real individual God, had missed out on declaring God's intentions for mankind's development. And instead, what we've got on the earth is a whole group of different types of religions that are all being started through this connection with spirits. And that all begun because of our impatience and our unwillingness to address our addictions. So, so even right down to the individual level, it's the same pro problem. So, so when we're impatient and we're unwilling to address our addictions, we will attract spirits to us, guaranteed, who want to fulfil our addictions rather than we have to go through the sincere process of changing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so what I'd recommend to people instead of doing that is to firstly focus on the addictions. And the beauty of addictions is they can be easily exposed because every time you get angry, every time you get frustrated, every time you get annoyed, it's because an addiction is not being met. So every time one of those things happen, you know, oh, another addiction. <laughs> now I've just got to find it. What is it, this other addiction? The more addictions we can remove from ourselves, the more patient we'll become. And also the less attractions there will be to groups of spirits who are willing to fulfill our addictions. So then they will be removed from our life through a process. And once they are removed from our life, now we can begin to have a straight or a connected feeling with God directly rather than having all of these connections with spirits that are around us. Yep. And I see that as a primary thing that we need to go through. That's why Mary and I have often spoken to people about their addictions and fears and so forth because fears create addictions. Um, because we, we, f we feel that is the primary reason why people get influenced by spirits rather than being influenced through their connection with God. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say it's probably worth mentioning hurt because that feeling hurt shows an addiction. Oh, yeah, the hurt feeling is, is usually actually covering a lot of anger, <laughs> yeah. usually. So, yes, related, it's definitely related. Yeah. yeah. If we go across the day. Uh, just two questions. Mm -hmm. um, first one back to soulmates again. Yep. Would there be, say, a small list of uh, telltales, I, say, I guess, as to um, meeting, meeting your soulmate? I know we can, we can ask God, but I'm not exactly getting clear answers at the moment. So you want telltales? <laughs> okay. 
Well, I believe, I think I know who your soulmate is. But I guess a, a little bit of uh, reassurance, maybe. You <laughs> want to be told yes or no? <laughs> no, no. I, I, oh, yeah, I don't know. That'll, that'll be too easy, I think. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's how God feels about it, too. <laughs> yeah. God's very keen on you discovering your soulmate for a lot of reasons. You know, obviously, the soulmate is the other half of yourself. And so God's very keen to lead you to the other half of yourself. And however, in terms of telling a person their soulmate or telltale signs that somebody is a soulmate, um, it is far better to do this instead. Here's you, and in your case, you've got male body, so there's your male body. Your soulmate is obviously... What's the, what's the gender you're attracted to primarily? Female. So your soulmate is obviously a woman, so it's a female. And so there's her body, spirit body. There's her somewhere in the universe. Mm. Yes. How do you get her? How do you get connected with her is the question really, isn't it? Now, somebody coming along and telling you, oh, that person's your soulmate, isn't really going to establish any connection, mm. even if that person does know. And there are many people, spirits in the spirit world in particular, who do know who your soulmate is. Um, but if they told you, it wouldn't help you. Right? What's going to help you is two, two primary things. Firstly, connect truly with yourself. This person to have a relationship with you is going to have to connect to you. You're going to have to know yourself pretty well if that's going to ever happen. So you're going to have to be connected to you. That means you're going to have to be connected to your desires. You're going to have to be connected to your longings. You're going to have to know yourself. You're going to have to know your errors. You're going to have to heal yourself to know these things. Focus on that, number one. So connecting to yourself and your desires. Now remember, it's not just your errors you want to connect to because your errors eventually will disappear. Mm. You've got to connect to your desires because your desires are your true self, particularly, and I'm saying here, your desires that are harmonious with love are your true self. So if you're passionate about playing music, for example, connect with that desire more fully, right? Because that's a part of your true nature. Don't expect anybody else to do it for you. You connect to it more fully. If you're an artist, do the same. If you're whatever, whatever it is you're passionate about. If you're passionate about mass, connect to mass more fully. You know what I mean? That's part of the desire. If you're passionate about science, connect to science more fully. These particular things will cause you to have a stronger connection with yourself. When you have a stronger connection with yourself, you are now open to connecting to the other half of yourself. And you're actually helping the other half of yourself recognise you. Because if you're just in a facade, how can they recognise you? They can't. When they see you, they'll walk past you in the street, go, oh, yeah, another guy, oh, yeah, Dave's pretty good looking, another good looking guy, and might feel a little bit of interest, but there's no real connection because they don't see the real you. They only see the facade. They only see the outward form. Soulmate relationship is about soul, your feelings in the soul. Now, if you do that, and the second thing you need to do, so that's number one, and number two is remove intergender barriers which are all emotional. So, how do you feel about your mum? How do you feel about your dad? What have things happened as a child? How much do you want your mum to look after you? How much do you want your dad to look after you? These are all things that you need to allow yourself to, to remove from yourself because if you keep them inside of yourself, you will have these barriers with the other half of yourself, particularly because the other half of yourself is a female. Um, you will have the, those barriers. But even if you were in the same gender uh, attraction, you'll still have barriers if you don't remove the intergender emotional barriers that you have. So look at your addictions with people of specific gender. So what are your addictions to men? What are your addictions to women? Your addictions to men, in your case, will tell you all of the things you don't necessarily like about yourself or that you need from men that you're not willing to give yourself. And your addictions to women will tell you all the things you don't like about women or all the things you think you need from women. right? 
and they need to be removed from yourself. Now, as you do that, you automatically become more and more and more and more open inside of your soul to the other half of yourself. No matter what condition she is in, you'll become more and more and more open. And you'll get to the point where you'll recognise her and know her. You'll draw her into your life if you haven't already. You'll recognise her and she might not even recognise you at that point. And because you've healed a lot of these problems, you'll be able to still recognise her and engage her in a similar process without pushing her in that process. Does that make sense? Now, a lot of people want to know who their soulmate is so that they can avoid those two particular <laughs> processes. Does that make sense? That's why God doesn't send you a telegram. Because <laughs> he wants you just to do those things. Yeah, I understand. I guess just with um, my sort of situation... I think I've already, like I was talking about yesterday, had met my soulmate. Yeah. Um, and there was just a lot of things that sort of happened during that time that really sort of made me look back and go, Jesus, I think... Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, you can use my you know, uh, name as a swear. That's fine. <laughs> um, that maybe that's actually what, what it was because a lot of the females I had in my life before that met yeah. my addictions very well. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, quite sexually promiscuous and everything like that. Yeah. Found myself in a relationship where I just went, I just could have complete changes really in a lot of ways. Like, yep. I felt that I knew that person. Yeah. Um, from the minute that we sort of met, really. Yeah. And it was just, I kind of, well, I tried to pull myself away from it because I just come out of a big relationship. Yeah. And I didn't want to go back into another one, but I found myself that I, that I couldn't. It was just an almost <laughs> impossibility to to walk away. There's only three options as to why we're drawn. One option is that we're in addiction still and they have very compatible addictions. So that's one option. The second option is that um, we are being influenced by spirits who are overcloaking each of us who want us to have a relationship. That's the second option. And the third option is that we're soulmates. Does that make sense? Like, so, so it's one of those three options and we need to be in a position to be able to know which one. And the only way we're going to get in a position to know which one is by doing these things. Mm. Now, in the spirit world, it's rare for people to actually recognise their soulmates until they're in the fifth dimension, until they're in the fifth sphere of their progression. And the reason why it's in, it's in the fourth sphere of your progression that you finish up removing a lot of the intergender emotional injuries that you carry from Earth. And as a result of that, you then can start to recognise your soulmate after that time. Now, for, for me, that took me nearly eight years of emotional work mm. to get to the point where I could actually recognise my soulmate. So eight years of a single life, right? And that's what it took, took me to recognise my soulmate. And I feel a lot of people who say they know who their soulmate is still really don't know who their soulmate is many times. And because they're yet to go through this work. You know, they're yet to connect with their p true passions and desires and they're yet to deal with their intergender emotional injuries. If you look at your general life, you can see that uh, your relationships with men and your relationships with women are confronting. And for most people that's the case. And these are great. This is a great confrontation because it, what it does is it causes you to work through these issues. If you embrace the process in a loving way, you'll work through the issues. So my suggestion is we do want to attract our soulmates. A soulmate relationship is the only forever-based relationship we're ever going to have, aside from our relationship with God. Right? And for that reason, it's a very important relationship. It also is a great relationship in terms of fully embracing yourself because the other half of yourself is a part of who you are and it teaches you a lot in this process. It's a fantastic process that God has created. The key is to not be impatient with it mm. and then to start wanting spirits to tell you who your soulmate is and all these kind of things because what happens then is they'll start telling you things that are not true, many of them, and you'll get misled down this track rather than dealing with the real issues. So my suggestion always when it comes to soulmates is deal with the real issues. Now, in many times in our travels, we see soulmates because um, you get to a point in your own development where you can feel certain people are soulmates for certain. Um, however, when those people come up and ask, are we soulmates or is that person my soulmate? 
we generally will say, what do you feel? You know, what, what have you dealt with these particular issues? Because many times we see that people haven't dealt with these issues and they do have an underlying suspicion of who their soulmate is. But if you don't deal with those issues, it's going to be very, very hard for you to maintain a relationship once you meet anyway mm -hmm. uh, without dealing with these issues. Yeah, I think that that would definitely be in, in my case, yep. for sure, because it, it was impossible to maintain the relationship. Yeah. But even if it's not, you know, I was still at that idea that those were the things that I'd need to be really working on. Yeah, so um, focus on those things. Mm. Uh, work, and in particular, if your mum and dad are alive, engage the process of sorting through the issues that you have with them. And, and many people are not aware of their codependent addictions they have with their parents. And we need to work through them to, to, to break down the barriers between ourselves and our other half. Mm. Yep. Whether our other half is of the same gender or not. Mm. Yep. Okay, thank you. The second question, this one should be much quicker. Yep. Uh, water fasting, is it very helpful for connecting in with your emotions? Uh, well, the drinking of water is essential for the connection of your emotions. Um, my spirit friends have often recommended to me to drink more than six litres of water every day. Um, and at the moment I probably manage about four litres of water a day. Um, while we're travelling it's a bit hard because you've got to stop every, <laughs> every half an hour or 15 minutes or so. But, uh, but the more water you, you see, emotion is conducted through water. So, so the flow of emotion is certainly going to be assisted by the more that you drink. If you, if you go on to water fasting... Um, you've got to start asking yourself the question as to why, what's the underlying purpose. For a lot of people, it's about punishment of themselves, yeah. or restricting themselves yeah. from having something they enjoy. Yeah. And we must come to understand that if we love ourselves, we are not going to do that to ourselves. So while it may have a role, a temporary role in assisting us, we are far better off, I feel, having a regular process where every single day we drink four to six litres of water. Well, I'm, I'm drinking about six to eight litres of water. Yeah. I've been doing that for the last few months. Yeah. And I tried water fasting for about four days recently. Yeah. And um, I guess I just wanted to some confirmation to see if it actually is as useful to do it every now and then because I have really struggled to connect in with emotions. Yeah. It will help you, but it will not help you as much as working through your barriers to connecting with your emotions will. Mm -hmm. So in other words, fears. yeah, working through your fears, because it's always the fears that dictate everything. So it is far more powerful to address your fears and your addictions than it is to drink more water. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes Some, sense. However, yeah, drinking yeah. more water will assist you to fa face your addictions and your fears. Yeah. So bring them all in together. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Often it's tempting to do something externally to force ourselves emotionally yeah. when in the end, if, even if we achieve some connection with emotion by forcing ourselves through a situation or restricting something in our lives, in the end we're still left with the barrier that was there in the first place that we're going to have to get over every time. Yeah. So I've found most effective, it requires patience and often I get very impatient with myself but it's more effective to actually sit with the resistance, sit with the fear and be real about it and know that I'm going to have to get through this if I want emotional freedom all of the time. So... Yeah. So if we can illustrate that from a perspective of um, what, it, what it looks like, let's say, let's say here is the point where we're actually cleared of emotion, right, of whatever the emotion is. Here's the point where we are right now. Here are our blocks to the dealing with the emotion. So that's our false beliefs about what it is to be emotional, the fears that we have, what's going to happen when I'm emotional, how people are going to treat me when I'm emotional... I'm going to feel out of control when I'm emotional, all of those things. All yeah. those beliefs. And then here is the actual emotion that's going to heal us, which is always usually grief-related. Now, what the majority of us try to do is we try to do this. <laughs> now, you may be successful sometimes in doing this, but the problem is, as Mary just said, the block remains. So that means that every single time you do it, you're going to have to do this. And that's going to get more, diff more and more difficult, can you see, as time goes on. Some of the grief will come up 
But the real grief that's covered by lots of blocks, the fears and the, and the different uh, addictions and so forth, they are not going to be exposed. What we need to learn to do emotionally, remember this is an emotional, not an intellectual process, is that we need to emotionally go through this to get to that. Mm -hmm. And that's what most people get very frustrated with. Because the blocks are very difficult to emotionally go through. But we need to emotionally go through them to release them. See, once we emotionally go through the block, it's like having the block no longer there. Once that occurs, what's natural will be immediate experience of the grief. Right? And that's why it's so important to actually emotionally address the blockages. Now, the majority of people don't like doing that because it's a slower, it seems to be a slower process. However, I put to you, if you have the block there and you're keeping on going around it, you're never really getting to the full extent of the grief. Yeah. And so therefore, this process, while it might seem partially successful, in the long run, it's going to result in longer processing. Right? Because you've still got the blockages stopping the full grief from ever coming about. Once these blockages are released, and as Mary said, they are fears, belief systems from our childhood that have entered us emotionally, all of those things, now, once we start knocking on their door <laughs> and getting into those, now we'll be released from that blockage, and so the underlying grief that's inside of us will just come out naturally. So I don't uh, get very stressed out about my processing at all. Like in terms of what I do, all I do is I focus most of my atten attention not on the grief itself, because at the moment I know I've got grief right still inside of me to feel. I focus my attention on what am I blocking? What, what's the blocks to it? Because I know that once I get rid of the blocks, the grief will just flow out naturally. I don't have to worry about it happening. I don't have to force it to happen. Yep. How do you recognise your blocks? And all of our blocks, are, there's, a, there's some great ways of recognising your blocks. Firstly, every time you have anger, there is a block of some kind. Go and find what the addiction is, because every time there is an addiction, there is a block. And when we, when we don't get our addiction met, we revert to anger. Every time we experience pleasure that seems to result from an addictive behaviour... <laughs> That's also covering a block. So I'll examine that. And all of these things cover our fears. So any time I recognise a fear within myself, I know that there's a block associated... That there's, that's blocking something. So they're the emotions I focus on my, myself on. And, it, and, and the way you recognise your fears is every time you feel like you want to get away from something and every time you want to avoid something and every time you... There your fears are. They're right there and we just need to recognise them. Every time that you feel a bit annoyed, a bit frustrated, a bit angry, there's your addictions They're right there. You know, we just need to recognise them. That's the fastest way to actually recognise the blocks. We need to feel them. So, so if we, we're feeling our addiction. We have to feel our addiction. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, like, it's like a smoker sitting down and deciding he's going to feel the feeling that he has of wanting to have a cigarette. Right? Instead of just getting up and having one, He's going to sit there and feel what it feels like to not have one, right? And he'll very rapidly get into some emotions if he does that, right? And we need to do the same with all of our emotions. We need to feel the actual addictive emotion that we have. I just badly, badly want that person to make me feel good. You know, you feel it like, and allow yourself to feel it. As you feel it, you will connect with why. When you connect with why, there'll be childhood issues related to that. And then underneath that, the grief is just sitting there, waiting to just pop out whenever we allow ourselves to feel the block. So that would be my recommendation to most people. Don't focus so much on the grief. Focus more on the blocks mm -hmm. to the grief. Because the grief will just come out of you automatically once there's no blocks to it doing so. Many of us are carrying around huge amounts of grief and it, it just needs the cap, the lid on the top of it to come off and it will just come out naturally. Yeah, just like it would have if we were a child, it would have come out naturally then if we were allowed to, to grieve. 
it will when we're an adult as well. Following on, following on from some of the soul mate and soul separation questions. Yes. If, if um, say, a soul's chosen to incarnate into a, a um, body yeah. <laughs> and half of it's going somewhere, when and where does the other half go? I mean, how does that... Pro is it all, you, you know, linear in time? Is it at the same time? <clears throat> I mean, time and... It's different here to in other. I understand the question. Yep. Yeah. So here's our the soul before it incarnates. When it incarnates, it incarnates into the two halves. The process of it incarnating into the two halves is going to be there'll be one half of the soul that incarnates first. It'll usually be a half of the soul that is more um, what you would call investigative in its nature. So part of the personality gets split as well and the part that's more investigative in its nature will probably incarnate first. The other half will just follow around <laughs> that half on the earth plane until it, has, it, it then has a very strong desire to incarnate as well. And it will just follow around the other half until nearby there is a couple who are having sex who, will, who, who draw this soul to them. And it has to match personality. There are a lot of laws involved. It has to match personality requirements of th that will trigger the emotions, the unhealed emotions and the, and the desires of the parents. And so it has to match a lot of the parents' emotions and everything in terms of triggering them and affecting them. But it's actually, there's a lot of laws involved, but rather than going into each individual law, it just follows the half of the soul around that's, that's incarnated already until it finds an appropriate receptacle... <laughs> To incarnate to, and then it does. And usually that happens within, you know, usually it happens within a few years. Uh, in extreme cases, it might happen within 20 years of each other. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. What's the time? It is four. Ten past. We have to actually finish because otherwise we're going to get kicked out. So we better at least make steps to, uh, to pack up <laughs> before someone comes to kick us out. <laughs> we would, uh, can we just be, before we go, can we just thank again those people who did uh, organise our event for us, Yvette and, and David. Uh, David. <laughs> and thank you guys. Yeah. And we'd like to thank Yvette for paying for our venue for us uh, over the last two days. So that was her gift to you. So we'd like to thank you for that as well, Yvette. <laughs> Um, we, myself and Mary are now off uh, this coming week to Bathurst. We'll be up there the next weekend in Bathurst. And uh, we'll be there for a couple of days and then we're back up the mountain range to near Armidale where we'll be doing some talks up there. We get up to Queensland, uh, we're there for one week and then we go overseas. Uh, we're visiting seven countries. Uh, this In trip. seven weeks. In seven <laughs> weeks. So, so yeah. it's going to be a fairly busy trip. And so what we, we'd love to, uh, ha to have you... If you want to, pass on, on any of your regards to those people that we meet. Uh, many of them will see you in a video at some point in the future. <laughs> and many of you we will see in those other locations as well. I think yeah, there's some, some people some here from you. Bathurst. And, yeah. 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 So we look forward to doing all of those things. We'd like to thank you very much for your donations to us yes. yesterday and today because that's what helps Mary and myself do these things. And we'd also like to thank you for your engagement over the last two days. We've enjoyed ourselves yes. uh, quite a lot Very the last much. two days, myself and Mary. I just also want to thank Milo, who uh, donated, or her partner, donated yeah. somewhere for us to stay. So yes. thank you so, so much. Thank you for yeah. that. Without knowing us at all. At so, all. Yeah. Without knowing us yeah. at all. Yeah. Thank you. So there's a lot of trust in that. A lot of trust. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's nice. So um, we're, we're uh, hopeful that we'll be able to get more information on the internet over the coming weeks. If any of you do have a disk drive that you have bought with you to do some copies, we can do some copies, but we're not being, going to be able to give you the copy immediately. So if you can leave us a return address or something so that we can post it to you, we'll be happy to do the copies over the next week and send them, send them to you. So if, if you do do that, can you see uh, straight away afterwards and, and just give us, make sure you've written an address of those particular things, yeah. uh, of the disk drives. That, so, so that, that you can get a whole you. copy of every talk AJ's really... Ever done. Ever done. Or oh, it's not quite, but No. There's about 50 in the that last, we haven't... Yeah, <laughs> in the last yet, six so. or seven years, every talk he's done. So if you'd like a copy of that, 
Yeah. Yeah. All right. Just a Is there anyone else here from Newcastle? No? No? no. I mean, not, not originally from Newcastle, <laughs> yeah. I mean right now, <laughs> yes. No worries. So there's not. Um, and, yeah, oftentimes uh, you'll need to connect with each other if you want to connect with each other via some kind of uh, email exchange or phone exchange or something like that. And more and more we're finding that different people want to set up groups in different locations. And so what we're doing is, as we do that, we're making... Uh, we're adding those to the internet. Um, there's a new website that I'm in the process of completing. I haven't completed it yet. I hope to have it completed next week. And once I upload that site, um, you'll have a lot more contact details on there and, and other details that you'll be able to use. For Pam, if help. you would like to be a contact person, if people in Newcastle become interested, just send us an email if you yeah. want to do something like that. Ten, yeah. uh, right, yeah. So that might be a bit hard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But the email address is office at uh, divine. divine truth. Dot com. Yeah, yeah we're and where on the you new are and so forth. And if we do hear of anybody else in that location, we can email them and let them know. And yeah. can I introduce you to the person who's uh, one of the persons who's actually helping us with the office email address? Would you like to? That, that's Luli here. Do you want to stand up, Luli, so you can just introduce you? Yes. There's Luli. So, um, so when you get a reply from her, you know who she is and who's looking after that address for us. So, yeah, And it's a lovely service that she's doing for as, free. Yeah, as you can imagine, when we're travelling a lot, it's hard to keep up with everyone's emails. So yeah. it's a lovely gift that Luli's been giving us. Too. Yeah. yeah, pleasure. <laughs> And um, thank you very much for your time today, guys, and we look forward to seeing you again at some point in the future. Yes, yes. Thank you.